What if the world of Hunter x Hunter had a life of its own? What if the setting itself, the different countries and cities within them, are only the surface of an actual living being? To be specific, a massive whale. And to take this idea even further, what if the reality that our characters know and perceive is actually the product of Nen? a conjuration-based technique that manifests life, nature, and other fundamental constituents of the universe, essentially physics altogether. This theory was brought to me by my good friend NF, one of the brightest minds I have personally come across on the internet, especially when it comes to Hunter x Hunter. And trust me when I say he blew my mind with this theory. There's honestly not a single theory out there that comes close to this one when talking about Hunter x Hunter. The actual argument that the world of Hunter x Hunter is this massive whale isn't what's really special about this theory. After all, there have been stories in the past with a similar approach to world building. What makes this theory so mind-blowing is how NF came to this conclusion, by observing countless subtle hints that steer in this direction, as well as what this theory could mean for the story on both a narrative and thematic level. This theory addresses so many questions we've had for decades. It is delicate, yet all-encompassing. If I had to use an analogy, imagine you were to view the story of Hunter x Hunter as this massive cake. This theory is the icing. It's the finish, the final layer that brings everything together and wraps up the entire story. The ultimate message of Hunter x Hunter becomes much clearer in the context of this theory. So, the entire world, including the Dark Continent, is a whale. How did we come to this conclusion? Well, it's actually quite simple. By observing Togashi's writing throughout the manga, you'll notice a pattern that he loves to use when playing with concepts. It can be anything, a flower, an explosive, an urn, a painting, whatever. Togashi takes these concepts and establishes a certain meaning for them that is paid off much later on in the story. The best way to explain this would be with some examples. My favourite instance is Genthru's Nen ability, the little flower, which established a connection between flowers and explosives. In a vacuum, this isn't really anything special, but many years down the line we see this established connection given prominence once again. The poor man's rose, which ultimately killed Meruem, functioned in a similar way, with a strong connection between flowers and explosives. Hopefully you now understand what I mean, but regardless, here's another example. The Nen-infused seed urn, which has been central to the current arc, is a concept that actually came up several arcs before the Succession War, way back in Yorknew. Gon came across this ugly urn that was made by a craftsman of such high skill that he unconsciously infused it with Nen, and that was the spitting image of the urn that was used for the Succession War ceremony. Another tie between York New and the Succession War is this page. In the Flesh Collector's mansion, Kurapika comes across what seems like a painting but is actually a former human. He made assumptions and was led astray, ultimately turning him into this thing, which looks eerily similar to the lone survivor of the last Dark Continent expedition. No longer human, much like the painting we saw in York New. There are many more examples of this scattered throughout the story. One thing about Hunter x Hunter that makes it stand out above other manga to me is the extent Togashi goes to in order to make this story and its world feel three-dimensional to make it feel whole and interconnected. Everything is so deeply thought out to the point you can reverse engineer almost every construct and concept within the story to find hidden meanings. Hunter x Hunter is always referencing itself. It's like this massive web of ideas that all flow into each other and work together. And that's the biggest selling point of this theory to me because it accentuates that idea almost flawlessly. A recurring visual motif in the series is characters being on top of animals. There are countless examples of this, be it on the volume covers, chapter covers, or several different points within the story itself. This could easily be dismissed as simply serving an aesthetic or symbolic purpose, like the animal connecting with that specific character in some way, shape, or form. And that is most likely the case, but I do think there's also a much larger purpose for this. There's a specific scene which is very important to the series 
theories in its own right, but I think its full importance is yet to be seen. If this theory is correct, this moment would be the setup for a payoff we will be receiving in the future of Hunter x Hunter, like Genthru's Nen ability and the poor man's rose, or the urn in York New and the seed urn in the Succession War. This specific scene is the first half which is establishing a concept that will be taken to a new extreme in the future. What I'm talking about is the first real introduction of Jing, the man who enabled this story. Widely believed to be the second half of the story's name, the hunter that Gon is hunting. Here he is, shown to us sitting on top of a massive beast, which is revealed to be sitting on top of an even bigger beast. Remember this, because it's crucial to the conclusion of the theory. Both Jing and Gon are also from Whale Island, a detail I believe is very deliberately placed by Togashi to hint at the true nature of the world this series takes place in. Sure, it's just the name of an island, but bear with me for just a moment. In the current arc of the manga, we are in the middle of a voyage to the Dark Continent. The means of transportation for this expedition is the Black Whale a massive ship that looks just as the name suggests. This voyage is loosely based on St. Brendan's voyage to the Isle of the Blessed, a navigator who lived in the 5th century as one of the 12 apostles of Ireland at the time. Some obvious parallels between the current arc and St. Brendan's voyage are how Kurapika's chains have a dolphin with a cross on them and St. Brendan's cross was made out of dolphins, or how Kurapika is on a boat with the 14 Kakin princes while St. Brendan took 14 monks with him on his boat. The Dark Continent has been marketed as this beautiful unexplored territory whilst St. Brendan was searching for the promised land which is described as this unexplored paradise. And lastly, the most important point is that Kurapika is on the black whale, a giant boat that is obviously supposed to resemble a whale, and St. Brendan ended up on the back of a giant whale during his voyage, which he believed to be an island. Obviously, the current arc isn't a one-to-one -one copy of St. Brendan's voyage, but it is interesting that Togashi made this change. In St. Brendan's story, the Isle of the Blessed turns out to be a giant whale. Why would Togashi make the means of transportation towards the Dark Continent, the Hunter x Hunter version of the Isle of the Blessed, a whale if the destination is one itself? This would mean the whale ship is transporting its passengers to an even bigger whale which is a similar idea to how Jing's introduction was presented. An animal on top of an even bigger animal, a whale heading towards an even bigger whale. And beyond this, the known world we've spent the entire story within is in the very centre of Lake Mobius, which itself is in the very centre of the Dark Continent. Togashi's writing style and implementation of certain concepts can be very redundant in the engineering sense. He reinforces and reapplies motifs in several spots to solidify the base concept. Essentially, there's always more to the picture. A simple example of this is how the black whale housing people is symbolism for the bigger picture of society. It's a microcosm of the entire world. Just look at the internal layout of the ship itself. It's separated into five tiers. People from all walks of life are present on this ship and they are divided in levels from upper class to lower class. The rich are at the top and the poor are at the bottom. And at the top there is a brutal war for succession among the royal family, which is obviously going to heavily disrupt the lives of the passengers on the lower tiers. The conflicts of the rich and royalty will have damaging effects on the entire population of the ship. The issues of those at the top extends to everybody below them, much like society itself. What I'm basically arguing is that the concept of whales in Hunter x Hunter has an established connection to the world as a whole. When digging even deeper, I noticed something pretty cool. Lake Mobius is a massive lake in the centre of the Dark Continent, and in the centre of this lake is the known human world. Why did Togashi choose to name this lake Mobius, of all things? Well, there's the Mobius Strip, a mathematical object discovered in the 1800s which is famously used for map reading. And the shape of the lake definitely looks like a Mobius Strip, but I think there could be another meaning here. There's a famous French cartoonist who went by the name of Mobius who passed away in 2012. Mobius would constantly draw characters on top of animals. One of his most famous works was a comic book collection where the main character rides this pterodactyl-like creature around the world. He has countless depictions of whales and is generally very highly regarded in the comic book industry. He was close friends with Katsuhiro Otomo who was a huge inspiration for Togashi. And most importantly, Mobius contributed 
storyboards and concept designs to numerous science fiction and fantasy films. The most important one for this video that Mobius worked on is Alien. Guess what Togashi's favourite film is? Alien. And it's clear that Togashi just has a lot of love for sci-fi, fantasy, and horror movies, given how he has referenced them in Hunter x Hunter. The most recent example being Chapter 393, with The Thing being screened on the lower tiers of the Black Whale. Why is this important, you may wonder? Well, Mobius was most famous for his world design. He pioneered science fantasy as we know it today. Movies like Star Wars or Blade Runner wouldn't exist without his work. All of his stories take place in these highly imaginative worlds with an incredibly surreal and almost abstract style. The world of Hunter x Hunter literally being a massive whale would fit the Mobius blueprints almost perfectly. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that the world of Hunter x Hunter is set on top of this massive whale, let's discuss the other part of this theory. The reality that our characters know and perceive being a product of Nen. What that would mean for the story both narratively and thematically. Well, firstly, let's establish how Nen works. The thing about Nen is that while it is definitely used as a power system, referring to it as such leads to a limited understanding of how it actually functions within the story. Nen is a constant of the world, more or less the law of the universe that certain individuals can tap into. And the thing about Nen Nen is that it makes up your entire being. Nen can create and destroy real, tangible, and material things. It has been described as life energy, and it's not something you use or create, but rather something that is tapped into. And that description is very important, because the thing about energy is that it cannot be discarded. It can be transferred or transformed, but it cannot be completely lost. It turns into something else. On top of that, Nen is not constrained to just humans. We We've seen the Chimera Ants utilise Nen, and we've seen objects with Nen of their own. And before you say that the Ants had human genes and that's why they were able to tap into Nen, UP developed Nen abilities despite having no human genes only the genes of a magical beast. As stated previously, Nen is the law of the universe. So is it really that crazy to say that the world itself was created by Nen? In Greed Island, we learnt that Nen can create life itself, as seen with the Pregnancy Stone card. Considering just that, let alone everything else we know about Nen, I don't think it's a stretch in the slightest to say that Nen is also capable of creating other things, like weather, gravity, physics, and various other elements that make up the known reality our characters live within. All of these things are inherently bound to very specific and restricted conditions, much like science in our own world. And by explaining everything with Nen, Togashi answers so many looming questions we've had since the beginning of the series. The lore behind every single magical beast and mutation in the world is given to us. We know how Togashi writes, he explains every detail behind every little thing, even when he doesn't need to. So we can definitely expect him to explain why there are so many super supernatural entities in this already abnormal world. The Zoldic family's massive dog, the Kurta clan's scarlet eyes, the shapeshifters from the hunter exam, Killua's abnormally sharp nails, literally everything we know about the dark continent so far, among countless other examples. All of these things would be addressed in one fell swoop. The bizarre and transfigured nature of the world would finally make sense. And I have absolutely no doubts about this because it's obvious Togashi is leading up to something with how he has tackled the world building so far, strongly resembling our world with slight but important differences. The world map of the known world in Hunter x Hunter is hilariously similar to our world map. In the top left, we've got Africa tilted about 90 degrees, with South America to the left of it. In the bottom, you have Australia flipped upside down. In the bottom left is North America, though slightly altered. And then the remaining continents strongly resemble Europe and Asia in size, but with bigger differences in their shapes. York New is New York backwards. Japan is based on Japan. The ASEAN continent is obviously referencing Asia. The various animals are similar to the animals we know in our world, but with key differences. Almost as if the Hunter x Hunter world is set in a distant future with a different evolutionary timeline that led to all of these mutations. It's very interesting stuff, and it all ties into one specific scene 
perfectly. This conversation in chapter 337, the message that frameworks are just part of yet another bigger framework. Everything in the world is part of a bigger thing. For example, a human is part of a community, which makes up a city, which makes up a country, which makes up a continent, which makes up our planet, which is part of our solar system, which is part of our galaxy, and we can keep going for a very long time. Small things, infinitesimally small things, are needed to build the entire universe. DNA is too small to be seen by the naked eye, but it contains unbelievable amounts of information which constitute our very being. The size of a thing has nothing to do with its power. This is the ultimate message of Hunter x Hunter. It's a coming of age story that was concluded thematically with the message of enjoying the detours. Don't get too caught up in your goals and ambitions because ultimately your life is tiny in the grand scheme of the world and time. Like how a strand of DNA is invisible to you, you yourself are invisible to the universe and its history. And that's definitely a bit of a tangent from the theory, but I do think it's necessary because what's the point of a theory if it doesn't speak to the themes of a story? A theory must be coherent with the ideas presented by the author, if it's going to convince anyone. It's not just about cool ideas and interpretations, but a genuine believability that can only be accomplished by being consistent with the story. And you might be wondering who I propose as the source of this Nen that makes up the entire universe. Well, who better than the giant whale that the world is literally on top of? Perhaps it's using Nen to create everything that makes up the world completely unconsciously, in the same way the skilled craftsmen infused the urn with Nen. The world as we know it just being a framework that is part of a much bigger framework, this massive whale planet, speaks to the core themes and concepts of Hunter x Hunter absolutely perfectly. What better way to end the story than with the second half of Jing's introduction, closing the series by zooming out once more, showing Jing, or whoever it might be this time, on top of a beast which is on top of an even larger beast, which is on top of the largest beast, the world itself, the massive whale that makes up the world of Hunter x Hunter. I absolutely adore this theory, and I hope you guys feel the same way. The biggest draw for this theory is, to me, the fact that it's something you're not looking for. This isn't answering a big looming question that was presented by Togashi himself within the story. Rather, it's coming to a conclusion based on subtleties he has scattered throughout Hunter x Hunter, just like the connection between Genthru's Nen ability and the poor man's rose. It's not something you look for, and it's not necessary for the story, but it's very much there, and the small framework of the series that is part of much larger frameworks that ultimately make up the entire story. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and thank you very much for watching.